Andrew, we first started talking, I guess, in 2018 about uh, about the future work and the challenges that uh, would be facing the country, we're facing and would in an accelerated way face the country. From, from TD's perspective, why was the future of work an important area for you guys to want to explore? Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, I think our partnership was really motivated by two different factors. The first is we'd concurrently just launched the TD Ready commitment in 2018 and pledging to donate a billion by 2030 to help create a more inclusive and sustainable tomorrow. And as a part of that, we recognize there are many drivers that were interrelated. So financial security, environment, health, sense of belonging, meant that a comprehensive approach was needed. And at the same time, we recognize there's changes and trends that were preventing inclusion, particularly economic and financial inclusion. So things like technological innovation, automation, demographic shifts, migration, urbanization, globalization, all the Asians, they were all affecting really the potential for people to be included in the economy. And so I remember, you know, when we discussed with PPF, the idea of developing this research project on the future of work, the idea of having a holistic and cross-sectoral approach really appealed to us. You know, with all the shifts and trends I just noted, we saw opportunity for sure, but recognized those same dynamics can really lead to inequality. And so the exploration that was at the center of the work done by PPF through the project is, you know, that we wanted to add our voice and resources to the effort. But the second factor is we recognized that while we have an aspiration, we recognize that we need to engage a whole slew of perspectives to tackle the problem, right? Government, academic, you know, institutions, uh, union and workers associations, the NGO sector, private sector for sure. So while we knew we had a role to play, PPF could bring together all of the relevant stakeholders for a greater kind of collective impact. And, and that's why this collaboration, I think, has been so relevant, Ed. Yeah, no, completely. And I remember the first meeting of the advisory group, and there was um, uh, somebody from your economics department uh, in there with uh, five or six uh, other members of the advisory group. And we uh, settled on this idea that there is a messy middle. And what we meant by that was that you know, um, at the beginning of someone's education and through their education or training, um, there was a system. You went to school, you know, you knew to register for JK or somehow or another, your parents figured it out. And as I recall, it was an all night process. So it wasn't all that easy. Um, and then there were scholarships and there were bursaries and marks were recognized. There was a system. And at the end, when you were gonna retire, and of course nothing's clean anymore, it's not a binary thing, but when you're retiring, there are pensions and there were RSPs and there was OAS and GIS. And again, there was a system, but in the middle where people were failing the vulnerability, there was no real system, it was ad hoc. And I'm just wondering now, do you feel any greater encouragement that we're getting a handle on the messy middle? Well, geez, and then of course, in between that, we've had the pandemic, right? <laughs> Which has thrown it, you know, it feels like when we had that conversation, you know, that was already the olden days. Um, I do think we recognize, you know, so much of, you know, work was always centered around young people, right? It was, it was always about that. And I think what we really liked about the PPF approach was to say that we take a life cycle approach to this. People have different needs in their, you know, future of work throughout their, throughout their lifetimes. And so how do we build the policy, the public policy necessary, the you know, corporate kind of strategy and HR practice necessary? And what are the things that kind of lead to that? So I think we have made improvement, but I think that's been rapidly accelerated by the past year and a half, right? Which is completely, you know, change is hard because we all stick to the status quo in everything that we do. Um, but what the last year and a half has given us is that we've upended that status quo. So I think here is now where we have the real opportunity to rethink this. Yeah, well, we may have been fooling ourselves as a, as a government policy advisors, et cetera, to think that we had 10 years of running room, uh, at least in order to get things right. And, and I think if the pandemic's done anything, it's uh, shown us, and we can see it in different sectors, that we uh, don't have 10 years of running room, that, you know, uh, both we were probably overestimating that and digitalization, other aspects uh, that are coming out of this have made it even uh, even quicker. Um, so, you know, we better, you know, stay, get on the horse, stay on the horse. There's a lot of uh, a lot of work uh, to do, Wh which I guess, Andrew, takes me back um, 
uh, to our partnerships and and a new partnership that we're uh, that we're about to afford that we're about to forge and and announce in the next couple of days. It's a little bit more dedicated, I guess, to economic inclusion and financial inclusion without. Uh, without abandoning this uh, uh, this aspect of the work, but expanding it and broadening it. So why don't you just tell us a little bit again from your perspective, uh, how you're seeing that. And, and particularly, I think financial inclusion is a little bit of a newer term to people than economic inclusion. So what, you know, what the distinction is. Yeah, thanks for that. And I do think this is actually just the next step in our journey, really, you know, we were a little bit more specific on the future of work, but you know, ideally, the future of work leads to financial and economic inclusion. So it's just the logical next step, I think, for us. And if I reflect on the past year, and what the pandemic has shown us certainly is that um, the issues of work, how people work have really been brought to the forefront. And at the same time, public expectations for what corporations should be doing uh, to have a positive impact ha have risen exponentially. And so that's for sure because of the pandemic, but I would say it's also been influenced by the growing uh, awareness of and acceptance of you know, anti-Black, anti-Indigenous, other types of racism and, and what corporations need to be doing differently you know, in that to contribute to those financial and economic inclusion kind of outcomes. I, I don't think we have a, a, a really specific defined definition of financial inclusion versus economic inclusion, but I can tell you how we look at it is really one of financial inclusion being more at the individual micro level. And so what does an individual need to pursue their reasonable hopes and dreams uh, to, to be able to have a, a, you know, a future that, that enables that. And the economic inclusion is sort of more that micro level sort of approach. And so, you know, at TD, we certainly look at what are the things as a corporation that are within our control, you know, the products and services we offer, how we look at our, our employees and employee status, uh, our supply chain, how we, you know, encourage different kinds of folks to be able to access that, you know, on the macro level, then there's things that we understand that are, you know, more, I think, policy driven, you know, affordable housing, of course, is you know, a huge one. Um, in many cities across Canada right now. And so, you know, there's, there's sort of both of those levels, very, very interconnected. And so, um, you know, wanting to look at certainly how, how do individual people see their lives being better along with, you know, how do we look at the hope for the broader Canadian economy for sure. And so, yeah. you know, I think in terms of the new project, what you're sort of, you know, uh, what we've been talking about is, you know, we want to continue to collaborate with Public Policy Forum, you know, and so we want to start now and figure out what are the new ways to secure fair access to economic opportunity for all Canadians, right? And so again, building on the Brave New Work initiative, but looking more specifically on the policy ideas and actions to create the conditions that we need for economic and financial inclusion, right? So TD has a role to play, other corporations have a role to play and can be a part of that, but we do need that sort of what's that broad tent to, to get those, you know, the number of voices we need in there and that perspectives and innovative ideas to do that. Yeah, well, I think it very much is a natural progression, a natural progression, um, uh, even without the pandemic, but especially so because of the pandemic. Um, so I, I, I do, you know, I want to thank you. I want to thank TD. Uh, I want to thank you for your support. But more importantly, I want to thank you for your intellectual curiosity, because, you know, that's important to have in, in, in our corporate sector that, you know, nobody's got uh, the answers. Certainly nobody's got a monopoly uh, on them. We have, um, you know, things that we're trying out and experimenting with in a whole different uh, uh, world order and to, you know, say, okay, let's, you know, let's work together to figure it out. And if anybody else is interested in learning about, uh, you know, the um, second stage of, uh, of this project, the next uh, phase of it, you know, please um, uh, let us know. And Andrew, in the meantime, I hope you enjoy the uh, conference over the next couple of days. I look very forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, take care, enjoy.